Good morning, church. Happy Christmas Eve. It has that feeling in the air this morning, doesn't it? Radiators popping, people smiling, people grumbling about needing to get that last-minute gift still. You only have a few hours left, so uh, you can rush to do that. Over the last three weeks, we have been guided through the themes of Advent. And each week, we have lit a candle in remembrance of hope and peace and joy. And this week, love comes into the mix. Every week, we have asked a question and also danced around the theme of, what does it mean to rejoice in a weary world? I think that is a perfectly good question to ask. I don't know about you, but it at times almost feels awkward recognizing these themes of Advent in our world, such as the way the world is today. Hope. It seems like the tensions that we have prayed for to be over are bubbling back up again. People are hungry. Injustice is rampant. It's laughable to mention peace. There are more wars today than there were this time last year. The Lutheran Church in Palestine released a statement that said, Christmas is canceled this year. Joy. How do you find joy and celebrate amidst these conflicts? And now when we're still trying to grapple with these first three things, love comes into frame and complicates the conversation even further. So how do we rejoice in a weary world? I have enjoyed our journey through Advent via Elizabeth and Zachariah and John. Like Reverend Harvey, I too had the inclination to skip right to the Jesus story. That's where I want to be. And so poor John and poor Zachariah and poor Elizabeth are skipped over every year. In meandering our way through the story, it just about feels like a screwball comedy to me. I can picture it on a black and white screen starring Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. A high righteous priest with unshakable faith can believe anything and everything except when a direct messenger from the Lord comes to give him a message of a child being born. I can hear Jimmy Stewart now, Elizabeth is going to have a what? It's not very good. I'm told ben can, Ben's given me this. I heard he can do a better one. So have uh, Ben reenact your favorite scene of Jimmy Stewart after service. But he cannot believe this good news, and so he is made unable to communicate, unable to tell his wife, Elizabeth, that a child is on the way. There comes a time when a man talks too much anyways. Amen? Elizabeth becomes pregnant, and she believes in the significance of what is happening. She prays, she discerns, she gives thanks. Her relative Mary is undergoing a very similar undertaking. Finally, she has the baby, and she believes his name should be John. The townspeople warn, you can't name him John. No one in your family is named John. But John writes unknown on a scroll, his name should be John, and so it proves a miracle. If this were Hollywood, this is where there would be the kiss, violins would soar, the end credits would roll. It happened in Judea, and that would be the name of the movie. But today there is one more addendum, one more addition that must be told in this story. Zechariah can now talk. Up till this point, the Christmas story has largely been told to the voices of women. After all, it is they who give birth to Christmas. But now Zechariah has to catch up for months of saying nothing. He begins to utter his first phrases. He sings a song of praise. He gives God thanks for the miracle that's been bestowed, for the promise of the generations beginning to take place. Gives praise for Israel being redeemed finally. And as he talks... As he gives praise, a new picture slowly begins to form. In describing through praise what this moment in John being born means to him, 
He says that through God's intervention in these, this birth, we would be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us. And in that moment, this black and white Hollywood film is over. It's no longer a screwball comedy. There's no set, this isn't a script. This is a hard, real life. We are greeted by the living reality of that time and that moment for those peoples. Could you imagine in what should be the happiest moment of your life, a child being born, God directly blessing it and bringing it to happen? Your first thought must turn towards, how does this child relate to my enemies, those who want to kill me? That is a reality of their circumstance. They were a conquered people. They were subjugated. They were living in a liminal space between being accepted just enough to survive while still worrying that there might be another invasion where their people would be divided up amongst a diaspora again. This had been the story of their people. This had been their story for ages. And for all of this time, the prophet spoke of an era where this would change, where there would be a Messiah, and they have waited, and they have waited, and they have waited. I opened up this morning by discussing the challenges of our time and seeing hope and peace and joy and love in our world today. But if we want to talk about a people who really had to look hard to find a sparkle of hope, look no further than Judea. If we want to look for people who had to really struggle to find a pathway to peace, look no further than Judea. If you want to look for people who had to search themselves for an ounce of joy, look no further than Judea. And if you want to find a people who had the right to examine the world and reach the conclusion, there is no love here for me and my people, look no further than Judea. As awkward as it is to talk about hope and peace and joy and love in the world today, maybe this is the exact right moment to be doing so. This season forces us to look at the realities behind the poinsettias and the garland and the sparkling lights. This season forces us to look at reality. And in this moment, there is a celebration of a promise being fulfilled, a reminder of God's love and presence always being with them and being revealed in a new way in this moment. I needed this reminder today, a reminder of what this narrative provides, that love did not wait until everything was fine. Love did not wait until resolution had been made. It didn't wait until they were already a liberated people. Love came when they did not expect it, when all the signs pointed towards there being no hope for it. That when love came, it was here, and it came for those who needed it the most, the way they needed it, and where they needed it that by God a way is going to be made, even if it has to be done so by a baby called John to a woman too old to conceive in a time and place where she had no legal rights, and by a baby called Jesus to an unwed teenage mother. Love was going to come. God was going to make a way. This makes Zachariah's praise to me feel all the more special. He could have grumbled. I might have. This is too little, too late, God. We've waited all this time and we just have a baby now. The people could have looked a ways after years of disappointment and waiting. But when this long promised moment finally arrived, they were in awe. They believed, they offered up thanks. Hope existed because they refused to let it be extinguished. Peace existed because they kept it alive within them. Joy existed because they refused to let that be conquered. And so when love arrived in John to make a pathway, they saw it and embraced it. They claimed it as holy and said, we have a calling in this story as well. 
Perhaps one of the overlooked miracles of the story is how when God's love arrived in the birth of a baby, they took that to mean more than just a passing moment. Zechariah says about the birth of John, we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear. I'm shocked that the first thought of this divine miracle wasn't, we can finally get retribution, we can finally get even, here's our time for revenge. No, this moment came and they said, finally, here an opportunity and a door has been opened for us to serve more faithfully. This act of love from God is connected directly in their mind to service of others. Because of the tender mercy of God, Zechariah says, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. After years of waiting, they have received an answer and they have responded by mobilizing into action. There's a participatory call to help usher in light into darkness, to peace where there was violence. John has arrived to start building a pathway for it. Jesus has arrived to be the model. But there is a deep recognition here in this moment that we are equally called to walk down this path being offered. This might be the answer to our question that we've asked over the last few weeks, how does a weary world rejoice? It rejoices by living out what we proclaim to believe, especially when times are hard. Love didn't come when things were perfect, but when things were on the brink. And sometimes in our world, it feels like things are on the brink now, doesn't it? And I believe that we are being told that love is much like the babies that we are celebrating today, like an infant. Here with John tonight, we'll get to Jesus as a baby that has to be nurtured, has to be protected, has to be let to live. I love the Christmas story and Jesus' birth and how it represents God's solidarity with humanity and liberation and a new age. But I've been reminded through this story of John and Elizabeth and Zechariah that we are being called to participate with this miracle. This story is a call to action for all of us. The story of Jesus is our gift from God, but the story of John is what we choose to do with that gift. In a weary world, love only dies when we choose to let it. When we decide that war is normative, that injustice is acceptable, that people going hungry and without shelter are just the way the world works, that's when love dies, because love is an action word. Demonstrated by God, God didn't just say, I love you, believe it, but here is action. I am giving you a pathway in John. I am bringing Jesus. There is action behind God. Love is an action word, and the gift of love belongs to us all and is only good when it's being shared. The story of John coming to set a path for Jesus is asking each and every one of us if we are willing to set a path to bring light into a weary world, to keep these candles aflame year-round. And in that sense, the birth of John is not a story of an individual family, but a story whose meaning plays out across every family and every living room and every street globally. It is a story that we are part in. I think it's close enough for me to say Merry Christmas to you this morning. And I think our world is similar enough to that time in Judea many years ago to still be able to hear the calling to keep love alive, to keep passing it, to keep believing in it, even when the world seems to be unable to see the flames of the candles. And so I ask, Will you rejoice this Christmas by taking love to a weary world? Amen.